for those of you that aren't familiar with some of this stuff, we have a Twitter fall here. Twitter is that thing that you've heard about that involves people telling each other what they're doing, like having breakfast and that sort of interesting stuff. Um, so we'll have some things going on in the background and let's see what sort of things people say. If they think what I'm talking is rubbish, we'll probably see that sort of criticism at this, some point on the screens here. This is uh, by far the most indulgent presentation I've ever given. Uh, I tend not to talk much about myself in presentations. Academics don't tend to do that, really. Um, you get up, you deliver an argument, you talk about some literature, you explain why you think you're doing something better than others and, and try to critique work that's come before you. Um, with this presentation, I wanted to, uh, for perhaps my own personal growth and hopefully for your interest, talk about the influences that led me to where I am and uh, the sorts of things I'm writing about. So the concept of post-humanity is one that I'll keep coming back to and, and try to articulate a thesis throughout this uh, about an hour that I have. Um, but my work really began around uh, 1998, reading a lot of stuff about uh, philosophy of mind. And this was uh, influential in a number of ways. I was interested in how uh, technology was being used in cultural practices, uh, focusing particularly on sport. This image that you see of, uh, well, what is effectively a robot athlete captivated me around about the year 1998. And what was apparent within it was this sense in which technology was transforming the expectations we had of cultural practices like sport. There was a degree to which this was becoming dehumanized, as some authors have, have described it. And this created a, a number of questions in my mind about where this might take us, the kinds of ethical questions it might provoke, and indeed how we imagine the future of humanity. Uh, in the brief for this talk, as you will, will know, this uh, subject area occurred for me at a time when a few things were happening in the world outside of my own bubble. Uh, I talk about this year as being the anniversary of two revolutions, one the biological and one that I'll call the binary. And I'll talk more about why those I think are revolutions. But those two influences, this, this end of the century or end of the millennium fascination with technological change and anxiety about it, seemed to me uh, the intriguing thing, the potential it had to transform how we think about ourselves, how we think about other kinds of lives, uh, and indeed how we think about the planet, the ecosystem, and so on. These kinds of questions seem to be all at stake when thinking about something as simple as this image. So after this, I uh, pursued a number of areas. And this concept of post-humanity, what I want to impress upon you is, this, is the sense in which this was influenced by a number of different ideas. So this depiction of, of terms is, is more or less broadly the sorts of things that were influencing me. I was becoming much more interested again in, in artwork and how different sorts of aesthetic propositions were evident, not just in artwork itself, but also in the way in which science was presented to us through things like commercials. And, and uh, some of you will know that the amount of money that goes into the, uh, to the development of a pharmaceutical is half that which goes into its marketing. The comparisons between how something is articulated to us and the sets of values that that implies or is suggested, uh, is remarkably different. So I wanted to be influenced by artwork that was imagining this world. The associations with biotechnology, this was again a period where biotech was going through an, a new revival, if you like, uh, prompted by the Human Genome Project, which I'll talk about a, a bit more as I go through. But all of these disciplines often operated in their own silos, and it seemed to me that there was value in itself in trying to encourage them out of those silos and to talk with each other about the same sorts of issues that they were concerning them. Many of these associations between concepts were counterintuitive. This is not something that uh, lends itself to much association. Thinking about the idea of the cyborg in the context of a cultural Olympiad, um, which some of you have, will have no clue uh, about at all, uh, was just not evident. Why would you want to associate these things? But the relationships between art and science were beginning to flourish. And so again, there was a desire to try to question what that relationship should involve and what significance it should have in public life. At the same time, film became a very important influence for me. I'm not a film theorist, but I love film a great deal and found myself influenced by film in numerous ways and continue to be influenced. This is uh, something that has been formalized in, in, in some of my writings. I, I tend to write about films within 
my own explorations of ethical issues in emerging technologies, and you'll see some of these. But again, what fascinated me was the way in which ethical narratives were conveyed through films, and not to reduce films to simply those sorts of um, ideas, not to suggest that films are simply about narratives, but certainly there were different kinds of imaginations that were present and evident through these depictions. And again, what was important and what was significant was that these weren't reaching very many people. Some of you may have heard of the Biomedical Ethics Film Festival that started here in Scotland, in fact, in Edinburgh five years ago. These sorts of interventions have become, I think, uh, indicative of how far we've progressed in bringing conversations from the world of science to a broader public. And again, that interested me a great deal. There were also important symbolic associations between different sorts of pursuits that seemed relevant. Um, questions about immortality, the possibility of life extension, the possibility we, we might be here forever. Uh, that kind of pursuit and the way in which it's articulated within literature uh, and other cultural texts, how does that relate to something like the internet? How do we pursue that desire for immortality through propagating a, a, a virtual or, or, or remote legacy? Is this something, are there some associations here that can help us understand that desire, that fascination to continue after we uh, cease to exist? So this leads me to this quite convenient uh, binary uh, polarization of biology and binary, as I call it. So the two influences that have shaped my own work have been, uh, in, in their broadest sense, biology and digital technology. Again, we can go quite far back to see different versions of a revolution taking place. Um, Time magazine in 1978 famously, well now famously published and, and, and coined this term, the test tube baby. And what interests me is how those notions become part of our common language, how they shape the ways in which we think about the technology, how they shape our anxieties and how they shape our moral engagement with the issues that they present. Um, the baby that was born, of course, was Louise Brown, who recently turned 30, I think, and had her own child. And tracking those stories, tracking the way in which the media talked about those uh, occurrences became a point of fascination for me. So there was a significant sense in which these debates were beginning to attract widespread media coverage, and that through that coverage, they were being rearticulated and, and reinvented, really. In thinking about the binary, again, this was the end of the century. The period was more or less when the internet was becoming popularized, and certainly not, it began quite a few years earlier. But the, the interest that I have and the, the, the ideas that govern my own work are all about those moments when technology becomes part of our culture. So what happens when we find ourselves confronted by new moral decisions about what sorts of things, what sorts of technological cultures we become part of or which we reject? Um, and digital culture was, of course, one significant part of that. So you can see here in this uh, very simple graphic from the BBC that the um, growth of the internet, if you can't see it at the back, the colours show you, as it gets darker, you'll see the, the growth of, of the internet worldwide. And, of course, the criticisms around 1997, 98, when these expectations of the internet were at their height, was that still people don't have access. Still we have this concept of the digital divide made manifest within uh, data about access to uh, technology. So there's a struggle in, in perspectives. Uh, on the one hand, the optimists who see technology as the potential solution to all kinds of social woes, and the pessimists who consider it to be um, ultimately, persistently um, inadequate. And for that reason, because of the co problems that it causes, we should seek to pursue other means. And I think that aspect of, of technology also intrigued me. The way in which imaginations of the future of technology and indeed the future of humanity gave rise to policies that would affect our involvement with them. 